Divine Truth Events. These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Faith and Prayer. Presented by Jesus on the 11th of May 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session one, part two. <laughs> and I suppose that brings us to a lot of the things we've done this uh, last six months or so because we've spent a lot of time setting up things for the Kenya Project. We'd like to thank you for your donations to the Kenya Project. All up, um, there was donations of around $40,000 to the Kenya Project and we've spent all of that money on getting all of the systems together and everything and, and, and in fact sending it over there also cost a fair bit too. Um, and so now there's three people over there, Paige, Carey and Dennis, and they all have websites if you want to keep track of how they're going, and they've been updating their blogs uh, just to let you know how things are going over there. Now Mary knows the blog names and I don't, so I'm just wondering, Mary, whether you can... Do you remember I don't know them? the web addresses, but I know the names of each of the blogs. Yeah. So Paige and Carey is called P and K's Truth Tales. P so you, and, and... Yep, it's the symbol and. And K's. Yep. Truth, Truth Tales. Tales. So if you Google that, they'll come up. And these are linked off of your blog, aren't they? Yes, they're also in the sidebar on my okay, blog. Okay, so that's, per that's uh, Paige and Kerry. Paige and Kerry's. And, and Dennis? It's called Kenya 2013. Kenya 2013. And it's just so really... So that one's Dennis. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah. Lovely reading there. Yeah, it's lovely their reading them, actually. Experiences, yeah. Yeah, yeah. their experiences. They're putting... Every few days they manage, they're in Nairobi at the moment and every few days they, in Nairobi they're managing to put some new information up so you'll be able to see what's going on for them. Um, there's been somebody who donated uh, um, a ve uh, enough money for them to buy a vehicle for the people over there to get around so that's been really good and it means that they can travel quite a number of places in Kenya that they wouldn't have been able to travel to before. So, so that, that's work, worked out fairly well at this point and those guys are really enjoying themselves over there. Then um, we've also, um, I'll just rub that off. We've also been working on doing these frequently asked questions. So um, Igor and Lena have made a corner of their living room into a sort of like a makeshift studio. And uh, we, every week generally, we've been going down there and recording uh, up to six hours of video. Um, for frequently asked questions and at the moment there's 200 of them on the net and we, we hope to have about a thousand of them or more over the period of the next year added to the site. So, Because as you know when people are first interested they ask a lot of questions and, and we want to give people a resource to be able to answer questions without having to travel very far or, or any of those kind of things. So that's what we've been doing there. So myself and Mary have been spending quite a bit of time doing that. We've started also doing discussions and about the Paget messages. We're continuing some book group discussions using the same method. And we also have been doing some mediumship that we've just started doing that it will be recorded and put on the net as well. So they'll all be coming up over the next few months. Uh, we've already put, like I said, about 60 hours of those videos up as well. We've still been continuing doing interviews. Um, and if you want to know the, the discussion that matches this talk today and tomorrow, it's the Paget message from Solomon that, it, that will be added next week to the YouTube channel. Just one question I have for you though is that we haven't actually, st uh, we've stopped producing DVDs and I was just wondering how many people would st like whether you would still want us to do DVDs or, or is it better? See, at the moment we've been doing a lot by memory sticks. So we have a stick of memory where you can fit tw 10 uh, movies on one stick and uh, with the new sticks we're getting you can fit 20 uh, movies on one stick and uh, it works out to be cheaper and also easier for us to get these movies onto memory sticks to send to people. But as long as people have a way of playing them, that's the main thing. Mm. So what I was wanting to ask you, just as a general idea, is how many of you would still like to see DVDs coming out? Is there any of you that would still like that, or you, you want to get with... There's a few, not many. 
Yeah, just a few. Yeah, I, I doubt whether we will be continuing with the DVDs because of this, because of the technology that's come out. My suggestion to you is if you would like to have DVDs, um, there's only a few other options. One is a media player. There's a little box that you can buy to plug into your television that you can stick a USB stick into and play movies from the stick. And, uh, and the media players are only... You can buy them at Dick Smith or some electronics place. And uh, that's probably a better way for, uh, for us to handle giving out movies as well because it means we can give you 20 or 30 at a time. Or even with a disc, we can give you our whole 600 gigabytes of movies, which is 900, 900 hours of... of uh, shall we call it pleasant watching? Or is it not always pleasant watching? Um, yeah, on, on, one, on one hard disk drive. And we're finding that's a far better way. Before, when we were doing DVDs, it was costing us around $1,000 to make up an entire set of DVDs, because, as you can imagine, there's 200 DVD, 400 DVDs in one set. So that's a lot. And, and instead of doing that now, we can just buy a, a $100 disc and put it all on a $100 disc and give it away. So it's much, much cheaper for us and uh, far more economical for us to give it away as hard disk drives than it is to give it away as individual DVDs. So I doubt whether we'll be continuing with the DVD process because of this. It's much more economical to do it the other way. Now, are there any questions about just those mundane things at all? Um, myself and Mary would like to take this opportunity, though, to thank you for your donations in the last five months and for those overseas who eventually watched this uh, movie too. Um, because um, without those donations, we wouldn't have survived the last five months. Obviously, we haven't been doing presentations like formal ones like this. And so we've been living off of those donations. We're hoping that the donations from this particular event will be able to buy a new video mastering computer that, uh, because uh, one of our computers has, has died and uh, can't be recovered for video mastering. So what we want to do is get another computer for video mastering. And that way, Lena and Igor will be able to keep up with what we're producing um, at the moment. They're just struggling to keep up. Once we get a new system, we feel they'll be able to keep up fairly well. And we'll be able to produce a few more hours per week um, of, of information if we have a new machine. So what we're probably going to do is spend most of our funds from this event and trying to see whether we can get one of those machines for them. Um, aside from that, I don't think there's too much to, to tell you. Is there anything you want to know before we continue with our discussion? Barbara, what would you like to know? <coughs> Just wait for Igor to get it. It's right. Try again. Right. Yep. Yeah. Did you have a good fiftieth birthday? A 50th did you birthday? have a party? Uh, as you know, I don't celebrate my birthday. So, um, um, what did we do? I think we did a, a pageant presentation, didn't we? <laughs> I think you'll find there's one there for the tenth of March, and, and uh, that's my birthday. We had a mini celebration with Lena and Igor, even though you weren't officially celebrating, I brought ice cream and they had... Oh, that's the, right, that's yeah. right. Mary, Mary made some ice cream, uh, lovely it was too, and uh, Lena and Igor shared it halfway through our pageant message <laughs> presentation. That was, that was my birthday. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel it's that significant. So um, the significant event is, is me connecting, reconnecting with my soul again at some point. <laughs> That'll be a significant event. Yeah, which hasn't happened yet. Helen. Mm. Um, back to the DVDs, mm -hmm. I've got double copies of some of the ones you've done mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if, if we could send them to Kenya or somewhere where people could use those? Yeah, well, this is the thing about the African continent. Is sending, it, sending it to the African continent is pretty pointless because most people don't have any technology at all. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're assuming that they have it because we're, we're so used to it, but they don't have it at all. And, and so what we're finding is that we have to provide them the means to watch as well as the things to watch. And the way that we've done that, we've sent quite a lot of things to Africa now, and the way we've been doing that is we've been buying media boxes, media players, and we plug that they can plug a disc that we send to them as well. And if they don't have a screen, we buy them a projection unit so they can project it onto a wall. Um, and... Uh, 
and we send the whole kit to them and that's the way that they can watch it. They don't have the funds to buy that of course because it's, uh, for them that would be like a year's wage just for all of those things. So, so what we're trying to do is just send to people that we know are very interested over there the material and, and letting them just use the material how they see fit. Now a lot of times what they're doing is they're getting together with their neighbours and having a projection on the wall and, and, uh, and so forth. The big issue that we have is having a way for them to interact with the material and that's why the guys decided to go there in the end. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Most of us don't realise how the other parts of the world live, eh? We, we think that because we, we've grown up in this kind of environment where pretty much everything is at our fingertips uh, as, and most of us have enough funds to buy with the things that we need to do things. That's not the case in, in the third world at all. And, and so what we're having to do is provide them the means as well as the resources. And um, what we're trying to do actually over the next few months is build up a kit where, where they have a complete kit um, that we can send them in a box, like a hard shell case, something like um, one of the hard shells that we have for our sound equipment. And where we buy the hard shell case, we have the projection unit in there, a, a, a set of earphones and a, a few, a, a keyboard and a mouse and a, and, a, and a little tiny, I found these little tiny computers that are that big, um, that you just plug all the wires into and you can, and, and they're purposefully built for the third world by a company in the UK that is doing it as a non-profit organisation and uh, they're called Raspberries, I don't know if you've heard of them. And, and uh, yeah, they have the ability to play everything that we would give them. And we're hoping to be able to send up these little kits for under $500 Australian each. And, and that's actually cheaper than just a whole set of DVDs. And, we, and we, we get them and that kit costs around $300 to send, to the, to, to, um, particularly to the third world countries such as Africa. And... Um, we're hoping also that if anybody wants to travel with such a kit, if they go travelling overseas, that we make up a kit for them to travel with. And if they want to show anything to anybody, we just give them a kit. And then when they're travelling, they just give the kit away to somebody who's, who they find is really interested. So that's what we're hoping to do in the coming months. So I'm just uh, going through the process of making sure the kit works at this point from a technical perspective. And then we hope to be able to just distribute as many of the kits as we have the funds to, to buy um, overseas is the way to go. Yeah. So that would be an interesting project for anybody who wants to go overseas. <laughs> and that brings me to this. We've got some old machines that we want to give away. Who doesn't have a computer and would like to um, be able to watch the Divine Truth material or... Or it's not a yep, Ivana, you want one? <laughs> the price is right. <laughs> now just let me see which one this one is. I don't they uh, both of these are running the Ubuntu operating system. And does anyone heard of the Ubuntu operating system? Yeah. Yep, it's a Unix based operating system. It's downloadable for free on the net. Again, it's another one of these organisations that does everything by donation. So what we've done is we've installed a Ubuntu operating system on the machine. Well, it's pretty easy to use. It's the same, same as any other yeah, software. So there's yours. Who wants the second one? Anyone? Don't be shy. You don't want one? No? Everyone's got a computer? I'm totally blown away. All right, well, if you want one, we'll put, we'll put it up the back there for, just in case you want to take one with you. Um, what we're trying to do is to give away as much as we can give away, obviously. So what happens is that we will be giving away a lot of things in the future. And what we're hoping to start doing is giving away discs that have the entire library of information on them um, that a person can plug into their own computer and watch anything they watch and you can also send it back to us to have it updated. And that's the disk update service that we've now offering on the, on the setup. We find 
because we've now got uh, nearly 600 gigabytes of data um, on YouTube, we find that you know to do it any other way is not that economical. Um, and that way, you can have a rotation where you send it to myself or Luli and uh, and get an updated version of all of the stuff. And we've now written some processes where that's quite like not it doesn't take a lot of time. So so that's what's happening with that. Is there any other questions about what's happening? No? Good. You're all very shy when it comes to asking questions today. Yeah? Is that because you already know everything? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> okay, let's get back to our discussion about faith. So this is a part of the relationship with God series, if I haven't mentioned that to you before. And this is actually session two, by the way. Remember, in, oh, it must have been nearly three years ago that I delivered session one on this subject. And, uh, and this is session two. And I hope to have more sessions on the subject at some point in the future. Because faith is a very important quality to develop. But what we've learnt so far is that there are certain things that we could call uh, the actual facts of the universe. So can we call them absolute truth? An absolute truth is the domain of God. So it's God's truth. God, of course, knows everything that God has done and therefore knows all of the absolute truth about the universe. So fact is a very important part of having faith. And we gave the illustration of when we, were, when we were younger learning the fact of gravity, which is a fact that we learn and experience way before we actually understand it from a technological or from a scientific perspective. And this is one thing we need to come to understand, is that once we experience something, once the fact becomes an experience, then it becomes a fact for ourselves. Right? And we don't have to know everything about the experience. All we need to do is experience it, and it's now a fact. We don't need to know that gravity is 9.8 metres per second per second. We can feel that if we let something go or drop something off of a cliff or something like that, that it accelerates towards the ground. We know that that occurs. And of, of course, the higher you are, the more the acceleration and therefore the larger the impact. So if I fall from a, from a you know, desk three feet high, that's going to be a lot different effect than falling from a building that's thousands of feet high. It will have a different effect because I'm accelerating until I hit what's called terminal velocity, yep. which is the wind resi resistance preventing me from continuing to accelerate. And these things are abs absolute facts. You can't change them. They are, therefore, the laws of God. They are parts of the law of God's creation. When they become my personal experience, now I feel this absolute fact. Right? That's the personal experience. So experience is a very important part in developing faith about future things. Because once I've had an experience about a past event, that gives me faith about a future event. And when I say a future event, a future probable new piece of knowledge that I can learn. So once I've had an experience, I then start to have more faith in future possible experiences. Right. Can you see that if you don't have any experience at all, it's very, very hard to have faith in future possible experiences. And so this, for this reason, the first experience becomes a key factor in developing our faith. Now, what I'm going to speak about now is we, we referred all of this, of course, to physical laws, didn't we? 
So we were focused on the physical laws before, the laws that are physical in nature and operation. And all of us have a large degree of faith, so much so that you could say our faith has become certainty. Right? This is what happens with faith as it grows and grows and grows through experience. Eventually you get to a point where you know for certain what the outcome is going to be. Does everyone get that? Now, with regard to the physical things, with regard to the law of gravity, we know for certain what the outcome is going to be. Living here on earth, for the period of time that we have, we have a certain type of experience, and this experience tells us with certainty that if I jump off of anything, I'm going to fall to the ground at a certain speed, or a certain acceleration is probably the, better, the more accurate term. So these are physical laws, but... I, Interestingly enough, with the physical laws, I don't, I don't go, oh, I don't believe that. Because it, it's obvious. We, we just automatically believe it whenever they're, when it's obvious. And we've grown up with it, and through our, our experience, it teaches us that it's obvious, and so we automatically believe it. The other thing that we've uh, spoken about is if nobody has experienced anything on a certain subject, then it's very, very hard for the first person to have faith on that subject. Can you see why that would be the case? So if none of us had any experience whatsoever with, let's say, interstellar transportation. Any of you got experience with that yet? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So interstellar. Transportation, let's go like that. Well, to be honest, if you were all reincarnated beings, you would have had some experience with that. The fact that you haven't had any experience with it tells me that you can't be <laughs> reincarnated beings for a start. Um, so, interstellar transportation. It's a, ma it's a way of, of moving yourself through space to another location in space um, that is not... That, and in between, there is no atmosphere in order to exist. So there are what we would call uh, boundaries of light years of space between all of these locations. Now, now, not many of us know much about that interstellar transportation from an experiential point of view. Would that be the case? All right, you imagine you're the first person trying to find out about the law. What would you do? <laughs> Well, can you see what you would do is what mankind has already started doing. That's why the space thing began. That mankind had to learn how to live in a vacuum by producing some kind of like craft. Right? So that's the beginning of the exploration of the knowledge of interstellar transportation. We've already begun it as a human race, ironically. We've already begun the investigation of space type of transport. Right? But we've had to learn a lot of laws in the process. You think of how many physical laws they had to learn in order to put man on the moon. There's literally thousands and thousands of physical laws that were engaged to put man on the moon. Systems that had to be created for the survivability of mankind in a vacuum. Systems that had to be created for the survivability from, from um, atmospheric matter hitting their craft and potentially damaging the craft. Systems that, of support of life. Systems of how they were going to eat, how they were going to sleep, how they, what, how they were going to pee, how they were going to poo. <laughs> all sorts, right? Systems of, that were all put together. And that's the beginning of the investigation of this process. See, man's in, 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 we're, we're very passionate about these things. We're so passionate that the and NASA spent billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars on this in order to be, to be these people that got to the moon and back. Yeah? And it, there was a whole series of learning that had to occur through that process. Right? But 
that's only a small part of the entire process of interstellar transportation. To truly do it, can you see that once you do it once, the next time you do it is going to be much easier. And then the next time you do it, it's going to be easier again. And if you found in through this process some laws that govern the physical, spiritual and soul-based part of man that allow you to do it, why wouldn't you be engaging it every day? Like if you knew there was an Earth, you know, 600 light years away in a, in a constellation somewhere in, out in space where there's people that you could meet and you could travel there just at the, at the flick of a switch, wouldn't you do it? Why not? Why wouldn't you? All right. Can you see it would enhance your life as well, wouldn't it? You'd get to meet the whole people in a whole different earth, like a different environment. That would be pretty amazing. Getting to talk to them, find out what their life is like, find out whether they're ahead of us or behind us in development, what, all these things. Right? There's so many fascinating things. In other words, there's so many joys that we would have as a part of that discovery. And what I'm suggesting to you is the biggest thing to discover that has yet has been discovered, because it was discovered in the first century, but has yet to be fully engaged by the majority of people of, of, on earth, is the actual fact, which is God's truth, the absolute truth about divine love, God's love. That is the most important thing you can experiment with. Now, to have the experience of receiving divine love, two things are required. I mentioned them before, and they are faith and prayer. But before you're going to find out anything about it personally, you are going to need to Experiment. And can I state to you, the biggest issue that we have is that most of us are totally not willing to experiment. We, we are a part of this society where we expect instant results. And as a result of this instant result philosophy, Whenever we don't get an instant result, we believe someone else other than our soul is at fault. Right? So whenever we, you know, somebody mentions to us, have faith in God and have faith that this love is available to you and long for the love, and you sit there for five minutes longing for love and say, I don't feel anything. That means it's just a crock of shit. Right? That's what the average person might believe. Or... No, I don't feel anything. It's just, this is just because it doesn't work. It's not true. All right? Now, I'm saying to you that the reason why this happens to us is because we're not willing to experiment long enough. A really dedicated scientist doesn't come up with a concept or an idea, spend five minutes tinkering with it, and they go, yeah, it's a crock of shit. Does he? The, f the whole principle of that would be ludicrous if you were a scientist. Right? And yet that's what we do with our soul. We do that with our soul. It doesn't make any sense. We need to stop doing that and realise that if we wish to have an everlasting future existence and we wish to grow everlastingly in this existence that we've engaged, what we want to do is to start seeing the importance of our own development. And therefore, focus on the developing the experiment. And the experiment is very simple. Have some faith in a few things, which we'll mention in a minute, and pray. And we have to define prayer in this process, obviously, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But we'll talk today more about what kind of things to have faith in. Will we? Um. I have um, uh, difficulty with the faith in that um, I went 
and did several different things for many, many years, experimenting what I thought was experimenting mm -hmm. and giving it my full, mm -hmm. only to feel that I went down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. And um, many, many years in it. And now it's very... I, I come to at least intellectually realise that I must be doing something wrong. So you're disappointed? Yeah. 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 And you know what happens with emotions that we don't allow ourselves to feel? <coughs> we should know by now. We've talked about it for five years, right? <laughs> so um, whenever you don't allow yourself to feel disappointed, you carry around your disappointment. So instead of letting it go, you carry it around. And when you carry it around, it infects your next engagement. Right? And this is what's happening for most of us with regard to our relationship with God. The reality is most of us have not experimented strongly with our relationship with God. We've had moments in our life where we have, but, but it's not been a great you know, like passion of our lives most of the time because we have had times of disappointment in the past when we've tried to engage a relationship. It hasn't worked, and so what have we told ourselves? Maybe it's not possible. I'm tired of having to go through the grief of disappointment. But can you see that if I was willing to experiment... You imagine, you know, I'm a scientist and I'm there with my experiments, right? With all of my apparatus there experimenting something. And I try one experience, experiment with one substance, doesn't work. Does he go, oh, I'm not doing any more now? Does he do that? No, see, his, his faith and his passion drives him through that disappointment, Right? And he might even have a big cry. You look, you look at a lot, a lot of scientists do have very emotional times throughout their developmental phases of whatever they're developing because it's pressure, pressure. They don't get the results they want. <coughs> all of a sudden, you know, they're having ex emotional experiences. They, they feel, oh, it's all too overwhelming. I'm losing money. I'm worried about finances now. And I'm worried about where I'm... And all of these emotional experiences continue happening. But what keeps driving them is their faith that they will eventually find the solution. And they don't stop just because they're disappointed. Right? When we were talking about the qualities of love before, one of those ones that we didn't mention was um, patience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it is true that we are always patient, even with ourselves. Especially with ourselves when we love. Yeah? Straight, straight behind. Hi, AJ. Um, I've always believed that faith was a, um, a quality that was created in my soul when I was created, just something undescribable. It was just there. There was no words. It's just... And it's not. No. Right? Just... Remember the original message that I quoted was from Solomon. And in that original message he said, what is the thing on God's side was the divine love. And then he said the thing on the human side was faith and prayer. Faith is not something that God has instilled in us by nature. Faith is a quality, like many other qualities, that we are going to have to develop in our life. And whenever we have a feeling within us that's there already that we haven't developed, usually it's not from ourselves. It's usually from our guide, like our spirit guide or our spirit guardian, giving us that impression but it's not our own. There's been many people come up to me the first time they've met me, you know, and they say, I know you're Jesus. And I say, how do you know I'm Jesus? I just know. And I say to them, I'm sorry, mate, but you don't know. You've got no idea. You weren't with me in my first century life. You weren't with me in the spirit life. You know none of my experiences. And you've got no idea. All you've got is a spirit telling you that they know. And you think it's your feeling. Right? And many of these feelings that we think we have are not actually our own. They're, they're feelings that come from other people. Spirits that we cannot see, many of them. And what I'm suggesting is faith is a personal quality, not a quality that's given to you. It's something that you're going to have to develop within yourself. Nobody else can give it to you. So is that like a Christian belief that... Something that faith is just there, it's not really... Yeah, there are many Christian beliefs. One of the Christian beliefs is that God even chooses the people who have faith. That is not true. There is this whole concept of the chosen people or the chosen race. That is not true. 
None of these things are true. They are, and, and if you think about it, if God is a loving parent, none of these things could be true. Because a loving parent would give the same opportunities to every child, not just to a few. Right? So all of us have the same opportunities available to us to develop faith. But it is a quality that we need to develop by choice through a process. Not a quality that we're going to be able to even intellectually develop. And it's not a quality that we're going to be able to have somebody give us. So I can speak, you know, the reality is I could levitate before you and it would still not cause your faith to grow. Why? Does anyone know why? <laughs> that would be the case. If we come down the front. Thanks, Nina. Because we haven't experienced it. Exactly. Just because someone else can do it, it doesn't mean you can. Do you see? It doesn't mean you can. Right? It just means they did. And it doesn't mean you believe you can. Right? And, and true faith is all about you believing you can. Not anybody else telling you you can. Not anybody else explaining to you that you can. Not anybody else convincing you that you can. But actually you coming to believe within yourself that you can. And that is a personal experience. That's not something anybody can give you. That's something that you need to embrace for yourself. Does that make sense to you? Right? It's like, it's like somebody can play the piano and, they, and you can come along and say, that's beautiful playing of the piano. Um, I, I know I can do it. Well, fair enough, you know you can do it. But until you do it, you won't believe you can. That's the reality. And this is why the personal experience is essential with faith. If you try to avoid the personal experience, you will not gain faith. You can't have somebody else develop your faith for you. Right? Um, quick question, AJ. I thought, like, faith, like, the seed of faith was always in, in us, like, so it's, it wasn't, because, like, in my experience, I always had some sort of faith, but, uh, like... <clears throat> but like I just said, Fab, for a lot of us, here we are sitting on earth, we have a spirit guide who has faith because they have had a personal experience. Okay. And all they're doing is telling us, you can do this, you can do this. They're trying to encourage you to do it for yourself, but until you do it for yourself, faith won't really exist. Right? All that's happening is you're being influenced by someone who's, posit who's a positive influence on you, and that's showing you that it's possible. So when you come along to these discussions with me, all I'm doing is trying to show you that it's possible. Does that make sense? But I can't do it for you. Because nobody can. Even God cannot do it for you because to do so, God would have to break the law of free will. So even God cannot do it for you. You are the only person that can do it for you. There are so many qualities, actually, within you that you have the potential to develop that only you can develop through a process. And only you can do it. Nobody else can do it for you. So many of us want everyone else to do it for us. We're addicted to other people doing lots of things for us. We, that's, what we, that's how we live our lives most of the time. So I was saying to Graham in the break, Graham came up, and you don't mind me mentioning Graham, um, came up and he was asking me about why he, he wasn't feeling God, right? Feeling God's love entering him, entering him, even though he believes that God exists and so forth. And I described it, it's like this. Most of us have these holes within us, right? These holes, let's call them a hole full of pain. Right? And what we have is we want the pain to go away. So we choose all sorts of methods for the pain to go away. And one of the methods is we project out to other people, please make my pain go away. And they then give us a feeling that makes our pain go away. Now that's called an addiction. Does that make sense? 
And you know what most of us expect from God? We expect God meets our addictions. So in other words, what we want in a relationship with God is when we're longing for God's love, we're not really longing for God's love most of the time. What we're longing for is for God to make our pain go away. Is that not true? You think of how many times you've actually prayed to God in your life. Most of the time, isn't it when you're longing for God to make your pain go away? Right? Now, the beautiful thing about God is that God never feeds your addictions. So, this is the main reason why other people will come along, by the way, and feed them, but God will not. What God wants is for you to get to that pain and get rid of it. So when you have faith and you really long for God's love, God's love starts entering you and then the pain is exposed, not covered over. It's exposed. Now many of you, when you start having your pain exposed, what do you do? You try to cover it back over. Right? And that shuts down the entire process. Right? And because you do not have any faith that the pain can be released, you want God to make the pain go away. In other words, you want God to enter an addiction with you. And God's going, no, no, no. I'm not entering any addictions with you. I would like you to let go of this pain that's like your big black hole so that it's no longer there anymore and trust that when you do this, I'll be with you, helping you through this process with you. All right? But most of us don't want to do that. So what we do is we finish up doing this, putting the, we, we start having the pain exposed and we want the layer back. So we try to get the layer back. When we get the layer back, we pro close down the process. When we close down the process, we're no longer experiencing divine love. Experiment with that. Experiment next time. Next time, instead of going, God, I want you to get rid of my pain, instead of doing that, go like this. God, I want, to help, want you to help me feel my pain. And see how much love you receive during that process in comparison with the processes that you've already been having. Do the experiment. Right? All we need to do is do the experiment. If we do the experiments, you will find that the way God does everything is with pure intention. So, so what happens then is if I have this feeling of wanting God's love, which is prayer, and I do not receive it, I know there's something in me blocking it. Right? And I know that it's got to be something about my pain because that's where I always try to put a cover over. I know that for sure. And so what I would like to do with you now is talk about some of these things that we need to have faith in if we're truly going to engage this relationship with God. So now I'm not talking about the faith that we can have generally about physical things, generally about laws, you know, physical laws. Now I'm starting to talk about the, the real big law, the universal law of divine love and how you can go through the experiment by having some faith, faith in some basic things about that law. Does that make sense? So let's go through them. Now, of course, the things that you have faith about, you don't necessarily know are true at this point. It's just a faith that you're going to experiment with until such a point that it's demonstrated that it's true to you. So... If we're talking about a relationship with God and receiving divine love, what do you think logically is the very first thing to experiment with? Any ideas? From a logical perspective. If we go back up to Jason up back there. Uh, have some faith that God actually wants or desires to have a relationship with you. Yeah, I'd put that down around four or five probably. It's, that's number one. Alex, you want to have a go? Then we come down. Um, desire? Yeah, I'd put that even further down, actually. <laughs> um, if we go, Christian, let's go. We're behind. That God exists. Ah, 
That is a big one, is it not? How can you have a relationship with a God that you don't believe exists? I'd say that's pretty hard myself. It's like saying, I, like, so me saying that joy doesn't exist. How can I ever have a relationship if I don't believe joy exists with joy? Impossible. Right? So, so this is the very first thing to experiment with. Don't you think? This is the very first thing to concentrate some effort on. Does God exist or not? It's a big question. Right? There are certain things that I can do to find out whether God exists, but it's worth answering that question first, isn't it? Okay. What's a, so having some faith that there is the potential that God exists and then making some experiments that might prove to yourself that God actually does exist would be a great way to start. Right? So forget about the... You know, religious indoctrination you've had in the past. Forget about the religions and what they believe about it all. Forget about all of those different things. Focus on, firstly, on this thing. Do you feel inside of your heart that God exists? And if you don't, how can you ever have a relationship with a God that doesn't exist? Impossible. So, to you, it, whether God really exists or not, it's immaterial. If God doesn't exist to you, you're never going to have a relationship with God. All right? So... So, firstly, we need to start looking at whether God exists. What's next, do you think? Fab? God, God loves. God loves. Yeah. Do you know what? This is where most religions on earth have already failed. Point number two. Most religions on earth believe what about God? That God is angry, punishing, will destroy the wicked, Destructive, and so forth and so forth. All of those things are not about love. Already, the test of most religions has failed because, in regard to faith, because they haven't established a faith in a God of love. To be honest, the majority of you have yet to establish a faith in a God that loves. It's not that easy establishing that kind of faith, you know. Why is that? Because the day-to-day -day life that we have, we often feel like we're being tormented or punished for something and all these other feelings that we have. And so we don't see it, we don't see it as it truthfully is necessarily. So in the end, we start thinking that maybe God's this angry God like my daddy was, you know, who punishes me every time I step out of line and only rewards me when I do the right thing. That's how we see God. That's not a God of love. What we're seeing is a God what I would call an, autoc auto uh, an autocratic God. Right? We're not seeing a God of love, we're seeing a God of rule, of iron, usually. And this whole, all of these Bible concepts, uh, you know, that Jesus would come and destroy the wicked. Right? And God will bring the great day of the war of God the Almighty to the earth. Right? All of those kind of concepts. And that's actually a quotation from the Bible, believe it or not. That God is a God of war and will actually bring destruction to the earth. There is a Christian belief from many Christians that they believe that the earth will be burned with fire in the last days. Mass murder, that's the God they believe in. A, a ma mass murderer. God is no such thing. right? And if we can't accept a God of love, how could you ever ask for love from God? Now, the majority of us have huge blockages to understanding that God is a God of love. And if we just have some faith, so if we went, right, okay, I'm going to at least even start with some intellectual concept in there. Oh, that sounds a bit woody. And uh, <laughs> an intellectual concept, right, that, that God does love. And whenever I feel that God does not love, I might be out of line with that concept. It would be a great place to start. Right? What would you say would be the next thing? Three? You want to have a stab, Graham? Okay. Just leave your hand up so I can see you. God wants to have a relationship with me personally. Yeah, I'd put that down here somewhere. What's the structure in which you live? Here's your clue. Right. 
Joy? Use the, use the mic. Um, that God did create everything in the universe. Okay, which means that God created what? Me. Now, before the universe could exist, something well, had to exist. He created the laws. Yeah, there had to be a structure in which the universe could exist in order for the universe to exist. The structure is the laws. So here's number three. God's laws are loving. If we had some faith that God's laws are loving, you know, we would be very circumspect about our lives if we had some of that faith. We'd be looking, every time we have a negative event, we'd be going, well, there's a law involved here that, that's caused this negative event to be a part of my life. There's got to be something in me that attracts these events and, uh, and that causes, there's some law that's in operation here causing these events. If we trusted that, we would believe that, if we had faith in that. Most of us don't have faith in that. You know, for most of us, you know what we do? We go, something bad happened. God's a bastard. They even call things that happen acts of God. The uh, whole insurance industry has it all written in legal terms about acts of God. Who's an insurance broker here? Isn't that not true? Isn't, yeah? Isn't it true? The acts of God. All in legal terminology, yes? This, uh, this presumption that mankind has that anything that bad happens must be God's fault. And many of us have this emotion inside of us about our personal lives. Anything that bad happens must be somebody else's fault and ultimately it must be God's, is the underlying viewpoint that we have. Now that is going to stop you from ever wanting a relationship with God if you believe that. Why would you want a relationship with a God who's a mongrel or makes terrible laws? <laughs> it's like saying, oh, I want to have a relationship with Stalin because he's such a nice fellow. Like, you know. Well, Stalin was a mass murderer, yes? Well, God's a far worse mass murderer according to the Bible. At one time in the Bible history it says that God destroyed everyone except for seven people. So that, isn't that what you'd call a mass murderer? Now, if you believe in a God like that, do you think you're going to want to have a relationship with him? Or do you just think you'd be scared? <laughs> what do we say in Australia? <laughs> scared shitless about having a relationship. And this is why most people in the world are totally frightened of God. Because there's these concepts of God that are almost in every religious faith. Do you, do you know on the planet at the moment, there are 2.2 billion Christians, right? There's about 1.9, I think it is, billion Muslims. If you add up the religious face, it turns out that I think it's about 84% of people on the planet actually have a religion. The majority of people do have a concept that there is a God that exists, so they have no trouble with number one. But the problem is number two and number three. They have no concept that there is a God of love that exists or a concept that all of God's laws are loving. Now, how can you expect to ever want a relationship with a God that has no love for you and is willing to punish you until hell freezes over, as the saying goes? It's going to be very, very hard for you to want a relationship with such a person, I would suggest. And, and there is this constant thought that God is arbitrary in the way that God delivers punishment. In other words, God decides, oh, I like that fellow, I'll let him get away with murder. I don't like that fellow very much. You know, he's just got to swear and I'm going to punish him. <laughs> there is this concept that people have on this earth that God is arbitrary in the way in which God delivers justice. Right? If we believe these things, that would not be possible. There is also these concepts of like some religions view themselves as more important than others. They see themselves as we're the ones who are saved. Yeah? Now, if God loves all of her children, who's God interested in saving? All of her children. <laughs> Does that not make sense? Not just the children who have a certain intellectual concept or a belief system or a doctrinal structure, but rather children who just want to have a relationship with God. And, and God 
would want to save even the ones that don't want to have a relationship with God. And in fact, God has a whole way of saving such people. Right? But most of us don't believe it. Most of us don't believe any of those things. Because we've grown up in an environment, in a family environment generally, where sooner or later somebody punished us whenever we got out of line, and they rewarded us whenever we were in line. And so that's what we think God is. A person who rewards us and punishes us depending on whether we're out of line or in, in line or out of line. That's what we believe. Igor? Uh, wouldn't it be important to clarify that there is one true God? As well? Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm speaking of here when I say one God exists. Uh, there can only be one, I would suggest. <laughs> if there is one at all, there only can be one. Um, not hundreds of thousands of millions of them. Right? There is one supreme being who was the source of all things. If there was ever such a being, there has to only be one. If uh, we believe there's hundreds of thousands of gods, then my suggestion is sooner or later you'll find behind the, all of those gods there is one <laughs> who all of those people or all of those gods accede to. But again, you don't have to make the assumption. You can do the experiment. Try to believe in a hundred thousand gods and try to connect with every one of them and see where it takes you. And see whether that takes you in the same direction as connecting to one of them and seeing where that takes you, the one that's supreme. We can make an experiment of every single thing. Every single thing. But it's a personal experiment. No amount of somebody talking to you is going to convince you unless you go through your own experiments. Right? Now, you can get together and share your experiments with others and they go, oh, that's a good experiment. I'll try that too. You could easily do that. But in terms of telling someone the results of your own experiments, then all you're doing is doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's not very effective, is it? Have you, have you seen that? How many of you have had the personal experiment that you know for certain you've received divine love after five years of listening? How many of you know? That's not a large percentage, is it? Right? So having someone tell you doesn't make much difference. It's only when you engage the experiment that things will change. Yep. What else could we have faith in? So we talked about God being exists. Many of us here have flirted with that one and sort of have a tick on it. Would you say that? Many of us here are not so certain about this one or this one. In fact, on a daily basis, I hear many of you cursing one of God's laws called the law of attraction. You don't like that law very much at all. Right? So that, that's, that's not a belief that God's laws are loving, is it? Right. And in fact, the majority of us still are flirting with the idea or concept that there is a loving God. And I can understand why, because for, historically, for tens of thousands of years on this planet, there is the underlying idea and concept that's been prevalent and that is that God is a punishing wrathful God who destroys people that we've got to sacrifice for years ago they used to sacrifice their own children the firstborn of their own children for this God and they felt that whenever they did that they would have a good harvest, they'd have a good life for the next year and so forth right? what's the difference between that and the sacrifice of Jesus for God? Not much. It's now one person sacrificing his life for God. Does God require a sacrifice at all? No. But many of you believe you are sacrificing every day still with your relationship with God. So that means you still believe it, that God requires sacrifice. You see, just because you're told something, it doesn't mean that anything changes here in your heart. You can be told thing after thing after thing the truth even, facts about God, and not believe them. Right? You're only going to believe them when these start to become your personal experience with God. And the only way you're going to do that is to, to have a personal experience with God. And that's completely independent of anybody else that's ever lived or ever will live. There are things people can do to help you. They can tell you the truth of their own experience, but even that is not going to convince you. Something inside has to change before you'll be convinced to, to try the experiments. 
let's go for another thing we need to have some faith in. So now we're starting to get down. This is, this is about God universally, is it not? What we've written there. Now let's look at God personally, as some of you have already raised. So what was one of the ones that you mentioned, Graham? That God loves me. Now can you see that if I believed that... The only thing limiting my belief of that is whether I feel I am lovable. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that how you spell lovable? No, it's not. Can you see that? Can you see that if, if I actually knew that God was a God of love in my heart, then the only reason why I would not believe that God loves me is because I feel that I'm unworthy of being loved. Right. And even then, it would be a challenge, wouldn't it? If you, if you accept that, then you surely would have to accept this. Yeah. So on that, on that um, thought, if, if I had a, a feeling that, you know, God just slipped off on the assembly line on that day and made me a bit faulty. Made a faulty mould. Yeah, just, yeah. Just for you. Just for me, because yeah, I'm yeah. special. Yeah, God's um, an idiot sometimes, eh? He just has a day off, bang, look what happens. <laughs> it was that seventh day that he rested, you know. The seventh um, day he so, rested. So... You were made on the seventh day that he rested. <laughs> Who made you then? Exactly. 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 Um, so that would come under um, believing God is a God of love, who is perfect it's the exactly. same kind of thing yes right okay. exactly you know and this is i feel um one of the things that we could even put that above here we could even put it here like god is perfect yeah god is perfect okay but let's globalize it and and say what we're seeking for is what are god's attributes and qualities and one of those attributes is perfection or infallibility, I guess they call it too, don't they? Yeah, 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 pure infallibility, yeah, perfection. See, none of us will ever have that. We all seem to think we will at some point, but we won't. Because we're continually growing towards God, right? So God is the one that has it, and we, we can get more and more and more, become more perfect. But whenever you expect yourself or someone else to be perfect, you're at way out of line with God. Because only God's perfect. And we can approach perfection. You must become perfect, as your Heavenly Father is. But at the end of the day, we must and not acknowledge God's attributes and qualities at some point. We need to know what they are. It's like, how can you have a relationship with someone that you don't know what they are and don't even trust what they are? Right? So these are still universal issues before we even get down to... And I'd like to put a few more universal issues that... Probably none of you are ever going to come up with. <laughs> do you, any more universal ones do you think we could add to this list that are not a part of those things? If we go to Joseph, is that just a couple of things there? And Christiana and so. That God is an entity or personable? Yeah, I feel this is all about God's attributes and qualities. Yeah, that's all part of that, I feel. Christiana? Uh, yeah, sorry, Christiana. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Infinite. Sorry? Infinite. Infinite? Yeah, I feel that's a part of this as well. Yep. 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 Right. Uh, God loves all his children equally. Yeah, I think that's a part of that, actually. Yeah. Okay. Love is not something that can be unequally displayed. If, if it's unequal, then it's not love. Do you follow me? Then it's a bartering system or some kind of transaction where, we, where we're getting something back from this person that we like better than the other person. If you truly love, you love everyone the same. Right? God truly loves us, so God loves all of us the same. And it's immaterial what we do, what, what, whether we're evil or whether we're good or whether God loves us still. We might not feel that love, of course, right? because of our condition. And in fact, many of us don't feel God's love because of our condition. Barbara, you want to say? I was going to say. Sorry, uh, with the mic. Yep. I was going to say God was impartial, but that came under just what you said. Hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, Max, the fact. Thanks. Um, that God rules. Yeah, I think that's a part of these qualities, and uh, uh, this one here and this one here too, actually. Yep. Yep. Like I said, I don't think you're going to guess my next one. Because it's not about God. <laughs> so now that I've given you that clue, do you want to have a guess? Max, you want to have a go? That faith might actually work? Um, well, that's why we have a faith, is to yeah. work out the things might oh, actually the work. the prayer might actually um, engage this and work. Yeah, no, I'm thinking more universal still. Not, no, not no individual idea. yet. <laughs> not individual yet. Do you want me to tell you? Yes. Okay. I told you none of you, yes. <laughs> the reason why I bring it up, though, is because I've had a personal experience with God, a personal experience that many of my brothers and sisters in the spirit world have also had. And when I talk to you about God, I'm talking to you about God's, that God exists, that God is a God of love, that God's laws are all loving. I'm telling you about God's qualities and attributes. And what I'm saying to you too is, you can trust me with it. Right? You can trust a lot of these things. When I say that I'm giving you a personal opinion, so when I say that, so you know when you, talk, when you ask me questions about earth changes and other things like that, I say I'm giving you a personal opinion. Right? Don't trust that. You follow me? Because it's just my personal opinion. It's, it's as much value as your own personal opinion. And I'd say that's next to no value at all, just like mine. <laughs> but when it comes to divine, the divine, the experience, the experience that we've had, now you can trust that. You can trust these truths. Do you, do you understand? And many of you don't trust me yet. You know how I know? Because you haven't started the experiment yet. The experiment with God I'm talking about. If you trusted me, and you, like many of you have come along for five years listening, uh, why, why are you doing that? Because you like what you hear a lot of the times, right? That's why you do it. But you don't like it enough yet to do the experiment. But it's only the experiment that will give you the faith and then the certainty. Right? And I, I, rem I wanted to remind you that what I'm talking about here can be trusted. And that's a universal thing. There's a lot of people on this earth who have based their belief systems, 2.2 billion people on this planet, have based their belief systems on some things that they thought I said 2,000 years ago, that I did not say. Right? I'm suggesting to you, if you're going to have any faith at all in God, Trust what I'm saying to you about God. You don't have to trust me necessarily, although in the end you're going to have to come to trust me sometime. You're going to listen to me for five years. What's the point of doing that if you don't trust me, right? But at some point you're going to have to believe that I am trustworthy. You're going to have to accept that at some point. And when I say have to, I don't mean that you have to, you're forced to. I'm saying that sooner or later what I'm saying about God you'll have to come to see as being true if you really want to have any faith. Now, most of you are still resisting that quite a lot, right? So when I talk about a loving God, you're there inside going, oh, I don't like God at all. Look what God's done to my life, you know. There's so much rage inside a lot of time. We had a lovely chat, myself and Igor, about this. And Igor said, you know, I just realised the other day I've got so much anger about God. I just need to tell God God's a bastard and get it out of my system, right? And to be honest, that's how many of you need to do things first. You need to let go of this pain that is inside of you through this experience that you've had that's been out of harmony with love and truth where you've believed things in the past about God that are completely false but you've accepted them so much so that you lived your life by them for a long period of time and had a lot of pain as a result. And you're going to have to let that go somehow emotionally. 
if you're ever going to have a relationship with this God of love. Yeah? So I'm saying you can trust me. And, and sooner or later, everyone on this planet, if they want to have a relationship with God, are going to have to trust somebody who already has a relationship with God. <laughs> right? And the reality is there's lots of celestial spirits now who have a relationship with God. And, uh, and all of them are trustworthy. Okay, so once we've got through all of that, can you see that the desire for God, or should we call it what it really is, a longing for God, which is, if we want to define that as well, prayer, would be natural, would it not? If you fully understood everything about God, uh, even before you understand yourself, if you fully understood everything about God, would you not want to have a relationship with this God if a re such a relationship was possible? Well, I, I would suggest that we would. Now, below that, there are many other things that we need to start having faith about. For example, and, and, and may I say, they all revolve around yourself and your own capacity. <laughs> You need to have some faith that you can change. You need to have some faith that you can become more loving. You need to have some faith that if you give up your addictions, you're going to be happier, not sadder. Does that make sense? There's a lot of personal things that you need to develop faith about that are all a part of finding out the truth, the actual facts about the laws of divine love. We need to have some faith that when I ask for love and don't receive it, that it must be something going on with me. Because it certainly wouldn't be anything going on with a God of love who's perfect, who made perfect laws that govern how the operation of love works. It has to be me that's blocking that all. And I need to have faith in that. That it is me. That I have the power, through my will, to change the future of my existence if I engage this faith. So I need to start having some faith in myself. right? So many of you are willing to start engaging some faith in God and at the same time you're still trying to avoid any faith in yourself. Right? You can't do that. Not and obey the laws of divine love which are the highest laws in the universe. Yeah. Nina, you had a question? Um, I'm sort of struggling with the Jesus is trustworthy <laughs> comment from the perspective that I'm not too sure that I trust anything much at all. I'd agree with that. Most people don't. And in fact, the problem is worse in the Western world than it is in any other place because we, we've become so, what would you say, jaded? Um, haven't we as a society? We think that everyone's got their own agenda. We think you know, there's no good people. There's only people who are going to manipulate us and so forth. Why do you think the media have been on and on and on at us about cult and all that kind of stuff? Why have they done that? majority of the time it's because they're afraid because they do believe there's no one you can trust. And you certainly can't trust a guy who says he's Jesus. Uh, there's been plenty of experience of that in the past too, hasn't there? But it's not so much you, it's my, my doubt or my jadedness. Exactly. So when, when you guys think of me as AJ, have you noticed that you can trust me more? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I find that interesting. But when you think of me as Jesus, you start thinking you can't trust me at all. Can you see the problem? This is the problem we've had with the growth of divine truth. Is as soon as I say to a person who I am, most people run away. Like people would tell you, media, the media wants to say that they, that they come to me because I'm saying who I am. No, most people, it's the opposite. My personal experience has been the opposite of that. Most people who hear me say I'm Jesus. You remember the very first time I said to you that I was Jesus? Some of you were present, remember, in Peter's hall there that Peter's got on the side of his house on that very first time that I said it publicly. It was six or six, yeah, five and a half years ago. Some of you were there, right? Yeah. And you remember the feeling? I remember Mary told me that she was just going, no, no, 
Lord, don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> I wasn't even there. I was watching the DVD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? And, and this is the thing, is if, if I had just said, oh, I'm Jan, I'm going to tell you these truths, many of you might have accepted them by now. But because, because I'm saying I'm Jesus, many of you still have a large problem with accepting them. And I'm saying to you, if you can at least see my character is trustworthy, you would at least start the experiment. I'm not asking to have anything from you aside from start the experiment. And I'm not even asking that from you. I've been willing to do that. Many of you have yet to engage the experiment and I've talked to you for five years. Surely by now you'd realise that I don't have much investment in you doing it. <laughs> right? Like I've, I just present material, present material. That's all I'm doing to you. And hope, hoping that at some point in the time there'll be, an, there'll be a spark of faith inside of your soul that causes you to engage the experiment. All right? And I feel a part of this experiment is the, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about, and that is, if we put it as number six, is the truth about the human soul. In the process of engaging the experiment with God, you will come to have some faith in the human soul. You will have faith that you have a soul and that you are one half of it. And all of these other teachings that I've taught you, at the moment the majority of you still have no faith in these particular things. Right? They're just intellectual concepts that you've been presented with. And there's not been a personal engagement of them because there's not a personal engagement with God. So this is what I would like to leave you with tonight. Make a personal list of the things in which you know you don't have faith. So instead of trying to run away from them all, face them. Make a list of all the th ways in which you don't have faith, starting with God. And be honest with yourself about it. Really brutally honest with yourself about it. And then when you see that list, have faith that you can get answers to every single one of these issues you have with regard to God and your own self and your own life. Now, I suggest to you that if you have that kind of faith, the next thing that you will do is... Is act. You will no longer be putting off actions. You will no longer be waiting for someone else to do it for you. You will no longer be reliant on someone else, including Jesus, to do it for you. You will wish to engage a personal relationship with your own parent, God. Because you start to have some faith that there are going to be benefits, personal benefits in your own interaction with God. Does that make sense? At the moment, many of us do not believe this. And that's why we are addicted to doing all the things we're doing on the planet, on the earth, addicted in our relationships with other people, because we're so focused on getting all of these things met through those addictions. Because we don't want to go through this experience with God for lots of different reasons. And what I'm suggesting for you to do as a, as a high priority is to note down the areas where, where faith is lacking and start developing some experiments where you can figure out how to get some faith in those areas. All right. So you want to first know where faith is lacking and then you want to make some experiments for yourself that nobody else has control over that you are willing to engage because you want to experience your own life rather than rely on other people to experience your life for you. So once that happens, once you start this experimenting process and my suggestion would be to experiment with all of these truths about God first. And then you can forget that one as well. 
Experiment with all these truths about yourself. Next. That would be my suggestion to you. And faith is going to be a key part in dragging you through all of those experiences. Right? And it will also provide joy. Like It's very rare that you see me in a down and out condition, is it not? Right? Now, I do cry. But I cry as the result of receiving love, having the pain exposed and letting the pain come up when I'm receiving it. I don't cry in just because I'm frustrated and I didn't understand this law and I didn't understand that law and what's going on and all those kind of things. Very, now it's unheard of for me to cry in those particular areas. Because I've found that all I need to do is receive love and all of these pains will come out of me. And I'm suggesting to you to trust that same process. Receive the love and all of these painful things. Allow the experience of all of these painful things that will come out of you. It will come out of you if you let it. If you don't let it, it will stay in you. And you'll be like this bottled up person. Frustrated that you're trying to receive love. Frustrated that your faith isn't growing into full confidence. Into full awareness. Into full trust. And five years time we'll be talking about this. And you'll be going, yeah I don't know if God exists still. And that would be a shame. And it doesn't matter what happens to me, it would still be a shame for you if to come down five years later and say, I still don't know if God exists yet. It would be much better if you knew for certain one way or the other. And if you feel for certain that God doesn't exist, then try that as an experiment. Yep, Sam, thanks. What about faith in love itself? Like if we have false beliefs about love, they're going to prevent us from receiving God's love. I agree. It's a big issue, isn't it? Like most people on the planet think that love is weak. Love has no strength at all. There is no security in love. People fall in there and go out of love all the time and you can't rely on it. And if you're talking about love with a partner, then there's no reliability with it. I agree. But do you know what's going to help you get over that? Is you'll start receiving God's love and find that it's totally reliable every time. Wouldn't it require for me to deal with my false beliefs about love too? Certainly. God's You're going love. to have to have some faith that God loves you all the time. That's where the faith will carry you through the false belief. It will, it in fact, carry you over the false belief. So the false belief is here. That maybe God doesn't love me might be the false belief. Or maybe love, you can't trust love is the false belief. Right? But if you have faith, it will carry you over the false belief. You won't, you won't live by your false belief anymore. You'll live by faith. If you live by faith, that means that you have a false feeling, a false belief, but you're willing to accept that maybe it's not true. Most of us are not do we're doing that yet. Most of us are still saying, oh, I've got a false belief that love you can't trust love, and I'm right. Don't you tell me that I'm wrong. Right? That's how most of us react when it comes to love. And I'm saying, no, if you really have received some divine love, you'll, get, you'll gather some faith that the false belief that love is not strong, that love hasn't got any stability, all of those false beliefs will disappear. Right? If you go through this experiment with God. And you won't live by them anymore. So the majority are still living by them. They're still going to themselves, yeah, there's no power in love. You look at what happens, you know, last week somebody said he loved me and this week he's off with some other woman. That tells you there's no power in love. No, it doesn't. It just tells you he's a fickle person who didn't love you in the first place. That's all it tells you, right? It doesn't tell you anything, but you but you're believing it as a false belief. If you had faith and you actually had experienced some of God's love, you would understand the constancy of it and that it never disappears. And then it never takes from you. And never takes from you. Yeah. Which is your primary fear, yes? That love is going to take from you. And you'll find that. Of course, love doesn't feed your addiction either, which is something you also want to have happen. 
So you'll find that God's love doesn't do that either. So there you are, wanting the addiction, wanting swearing at God because he's not meeting your addiction. Feel all that, let it all go, and have some faith that God, when you feel God's love, it's in a pure time. It's when you're in a pure space. Right? What I find is that a lot of these false beliefs, they just disappear from people if they had this allowance. And they always focused on the faith, the faith which involves the heart and the mind together, the logic and the experience. Where if they had some faith, no, God is a God of love. I can trust God. Right? God's laws are all loving. I can always trust that they're working perfectly. Always. And so if something's not working in my own life, I know it must be because I'm out of harmony with the law somehow. Does that make sense? Yes. I trust that, even though I might not believe it yet. I have a faith that that is true. Do you follow me? Yeah. yeah? Thank you. And true, true belief, in a, in a, when I say true belief, what I'm talking about now is actual fact will eventually come to me if I go through the experience and the experiment. So the actual fact is, love is not weak like you believe it to be. But you won't know that fact until you first experience love like that. The majority of us on this planet have never experienced a love like that. We've, all we've experienced is fickle love, fickle love, fickle love. And that's not love. But we called it love. And we believed it was love. But it was just fickle addictions being met. When it's true, when love is true, it's constant. It, if you notice, it doesn't matter how angry you get with me. It doesn't matter how annoyed you get with me, how many terrible emotions you project in me. The next week, I still love you. Have you noticed that? Many of you haven't noticed that yet. It's been five years and you still haven't noticed that. <laughs> right? But if you notice that, you'd go, okay, if AJ's just got a little bit of God's love in him, that must be, God must be infinitely more like that. God's not fickle with God's love. You can be angry with God and God's still going to love you. You can be sad with God and God's going to still love you. You can be ashamed of God and God's still love you. God's not fickle. And the only time that you will actually feel that is when you're open to the God experience with God. Yeah. So my suggestion with regard to faith is, uh, as I said, Note down all of those things that you feel you do not have faith in and then produce some experiments over the coming months that will help you develop faith in these areas through experience by actually finding out how the laws operate yourself, not anybody else, you, yourself. And you can ask questions of people and work out things and read things and do all sorts of things to find these answers, but do it as a high priority. Stop putting it off. Stop going to yourself, yeah, I don't know if anybody can really work out whether God exists. I don't know if a God of love really does exist. That's not being my personal experience. I don't know if all God's laws are loving. I don't know what God's attributes and qualities are. So I'm just going to ignore the whole thing and hope that at some point in the future it all comes to me somehow. It's not going to come to you that way. No scientist, of which all of you are, no scientist has ever sat back in his lounge chair watching the telly and waited for the laws of the universe to be discovered by sitting on his backside. He might have discovered a law about the soreness of his backside at some point. <laughs> However, the, the, the issue is we have to act if we truly want to find out for ourselves what is the truth. We have to. And it's the same as you, if you were a scientist looking at physical laws, you'd have to do something. You'd have to act, you'd have to have experiments. You'd... So treat your soul the same way. That's what I'm recommending to you. Have some faith in God's goodness. And where you don't have faith, work on faith first. Because faith is what's going to draw you into your desires and draw you into a desire of having a relationship with God. Faith is going to do that. Faith is the underlying motivation for you to develop a relationship. And that's what I would like to suggest to each of you to do with regard to faith. 
So as I've said, we produced a, um, a discussion about Solomon's message about faith that uh, will be on the internet next week. My suggestion is incorporate that as a part of your understanding about faith. Have a listen to that presentation about the importance of having faith in, in this relationship with God. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for today. It's pretty late now, I gather. It's dark outside. But thank you. We'd just like to also thank everyone who helped set up today. It was a good group setting up things today. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow if you want to come along at 11. It is tomorrow that it starts. Um, I think it's 11. And there's no more rapping tomorrow. <laughs> oh. um, is there anything you guys would like to know before we leave tonight? No? Everyone's fine? Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.